And so um, thanks for joining us today. We'll be diving into the topic of making schema changes in production uh, in your Postgres environment with zero downtime. Andrew and myself will be presenting today. Andrew Ferris is the engineering lead for PG Role, a new open source project uh, that is a Postgres tool for zero downtime schema migrations. And my name is Alex Frankor. I'm head of product at Zeta, uh, which is the company uh, behind PG Role as well. And so before diving in, I wanted to just do a quick few housekeeping rules to get started. Uh, so if you can't hear me and you just see my lips moving, uh, make sure make sure your volume is unmuted. Um, and then if for some reason we're lagging any, or streams buffering, just refresh and it should fix itself uh, and give us a shout if it doesn't. And we'll, we'll have live chat uh, throughout the whole workshop. And so if um, you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them in there just, just to say hi if you want to. Uh, and we'll also kind of uh, repeat some answers at the end for the recording. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we'll have, we have a number of uh, people from Zeta here as well, so feel free to say hi to them in the chat, uh, and they'll, they'll actually answer any questions uh, uh, while we're speaking as well. And uh, just in case uh, you, you can't attend the full thing, uh, we'll also be sending a recording uh, to whatever email you registered uh, as soon as it's available. And so with that, uh, I'll kind of just get started. So I'm from the Boston area uh, on the East Coast of the United States. We're famous for the Boston Red Sox, our universities, and Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. Uh, and somehow I managed to escape Boston without an accent. And so while not as old as some cities across the globe, uh, New England hosts one of the oldest cities or some of the oldest cities in the US. And so if we look back in time, Boston was a very hub and spoke city, built with many new areas continually added on with not much real planning for the future. That worked for them then, uh, but it wasn't really built for growth and scale. Now, in contrast, New York City put a fair bit of planning into their grid system, enabling easy extension, transportation, and growth throughout the city. If we fast forward to today, you, and you see a pretty large difference kind of in how both cities turned out, New York looks relatively similar to the original plan from over 200 years ago, whereas Boston kind of continued with the same tactic, expand and adding on without much of a plan. Uh, this eventually led to one of the most expensive highway projects in the country uh, to deal with the congestion and traffic. And so this story is obviously much more complicated than I lead on, and I'm sure there are many intricacies I'm not aware of. But at the end of the day, I just want to make a point that taking time to plan for your future saves both money and time in the long run. And so why am I sharing this analogy? Because there are some parallels that can be drawn to our topic today. Database schemas and making changes to them in production code. A data model can evolve a lot like a city. They need to be ready for scale and growth, adapting to new requirements and use cases as they come in. And mistakes can be pretty costly, uh, literally costing you money or causing you and your team unnecessary headaches. However, like Boston, sometimes change cannot be avoided. When you must change, it's important to do so with as little downtime as possible. And I'm not gonna read this quote or at least the full thing, but I think it does a pretty good job of summarizing the problem space, uh, particularly this first part. Um, database schemas are notoriously volatile extremely concrete and highly dependent on. Uh, if you've ever worked with a production database, I feel like this is something you can empathize with. Today's discussion is primarily gonna be focused on Postgres. It's currently having a bit of a renaissance moment and for a good reason. Uh, the development experience, battle-tested stability, versatility and extension environment makes it a pretty easy choice for any new application. And we're seeing a lot of serverless offerings starting to provide um, Postgres as a service. And so, we're, we're kind of making some assumptions here. Um, you're currently using or planning to use Postgres uh, for your primary database. Uh, you have that or are planning to have it running in production. Your application code is live. And if anything happens to your database, bad things will probably happen to you. Uh, and backwards compatibility between application versions is, is a bit of a requirement here. And so we'll be covering a handful of topics today. Um, uh, common pitfalls for schema migrations, some production rollout strategies, tools available to help make this easier, and a deeper dive into PG Role, our new schema migration tool for Postgres. And so before jumping into strategies and tooling, let's take a look at some of the gotchas that will, will get you. If you've ever worked with a production database, I'm sure you've run into this one. We've interviewed many developers and architects about schema migrations, and the one thing they'll all admit to is that they'd rather add columns than remove them. It's a safe play, destructive changes, uh, can be pretty complex, but things get out of hand very quickly. A single column can very quickly turn into multiple versions with different variations. And so this pattern comes from fear of breaking the applications, which, which is a fair fear. 
At the end of the day, having a table with hundreds of columns can lead to a few issues. You can end up with performance implications, run, returning certain queries, uh, having long living com com compatibility code with your application, and just general confusion for anyone new to your database. Can you remember the, the last time you came uh, and onboarded to a new production database? Uh, this, it's a pretty easy trap to fall into, and we'll share some ways to help avoid this pattern uh, if, you have, if you ran into it now. And so if you aren't familiar with Postgres, uh, locking is a way to control concurrent access to data and tables. Locks are used pretty heavily when modifying your schema. There are many different types of locks available in Postgres. Um, there's a huge laundry list if you look at the docs. Uh, as, a, as an example, any alter table statements will essentially require the access exclusive lock, which conflicts with all other lock types, meaning most changes to your table essentially make it inaccessible. So the general goal with schema migration is essentially to reduce this time as much as possible. Whether you've misused the lock timeout setting or tried using concurrently when adding indices and transactions, it's pretty easy to get tripped up. And so there are, there are generally, I'd say, many nuances to locking. We won't go into the details here, uh, but this is a common reason for downtime as well. So unless you have the exact same data in your staging or preview environments as you do in production, realistic locking scenarios can be pretty hard actually to test for. Uh, and so knowing what you're doing here is, ends up being pretty important. Now this part's always fun. Uh, the ordering of deployment for changes in your application. Do you deploy your application first, your database first, or both at the exact same atomic time? Uh, there's no completely right answer here. There's definitely wrong answers, and a lot of it depends on your application and the changes being made. Having data consistently, consistency between changes, avoiding things like schema drift and backfilling the data uh, appropriately uh, are some of the complexities that can lead to downtime uh, during this process. And so that's why the more, the more complex the application, the more complex the deployment process ends up being for database changes. And I didn't intend to use as many means as I did, but there you have it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, as If you have downtime uh, because of changes to your database, what do you end up doing? Uh, a rollback, of course. Uh, rolling back your schema changes in production is probably the only thing scarier than rolling them out in the first place. Uh, if your schema changes were a long multi-step process, you can assume that rolling back those changes will be even more difficult. And because of this difficulty, rollbacks typically aren't tested before deploying to production. In the best case scenario, you have short unplanned maintenance, but depending on the size or complexity of your data, it could take hours to revert. And last but not least, all of this can be impacted by human error. Large scale applications typically have large organizations with multiple stakeholders and end users, which means any downtime can be as much of a problem as anything, a people problem as anything. So having good docs, a collaborative team, likely some sort of process and ensuring everyone in the organization is on the same page is a pretty important piece of the puzzle. And I know what you're thinking, but automation takes time and trust. So alas, you'll probably need people. And so now that we've touched upon some of the pain points, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the ways you can roll out schema changes in production. <coughs> Version controlled SQL scripts. So relational databases, I'd say, have been around for quite some time, I think something like 80 years. Uh, and in some practices, have certainly stood the test of time. Uh, only a few weeks ago, I was chatting with the VP of engineering at a successful enterprise company, uh, and their entire database schema history was stored in a folder with well-ordered SQL files and a manual, well-documented process to run. Uh, he joked about not letting the intern near it uh, in, in the most serious way possible. Uh, I kid you not. So this, this happens uh, with large-scale applications. And so, it's a tried and true trusted solution for keeping history, making changes, and quickly being able to rebuild your database. But putting these and putting these files behind version control allows for some change management process. While maybe not for everyone, this is good enough for mo more businesses than you would think today. Uh, and so <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's probably the optimal solution, but it is one that out there and is still relatively commonly used. Uh, and there are generally two ways to deploy your database alongside your application, uh, coupling them together or decoupling them. And so when your application is coupled together with your database, you typically see something like an ORM or framework in use. And so ORMs like Prisma or Drizzle and frameworks like Django, Ruby on Rails or Laravel will not just generate schema migrations for your application, but deploy the changes at the same time. And so this works well, I'd say at a smaller scale, uh, but as you grow and end up being, there end up being a number of downsides from collaboration features to having less control over the schema migrations themselves. 
<clears throat> so expand and contract uh, is is a, a or I've also heard it called parallel change is a pattern used to migrate your schemas with zero downtime. This is something that's typically seen in decoupled architectures and has proven to work pretty well at scale. Uh, it works by applying changes in specific series of steps that add data in the new schema and the data itself. Uh, the application is both aware of both schemas for a given period of time, essentially. And so then deleting the old schema after the data has been backfilled um, allows this approach to uh, expanding and contrasting kind of what's being written to and to what schemas uh, more uh, backwards compatible and reversible. And so we'll, we'll dive a bit more into the strategy as we go deeper in a PG role. It's something that we use for that solution. Uh, but I think these examples come from both Prisma and Planet Scale. So it's a, it's a um, well-recognized pattern for rolling out these types of changes. And uh, I, before, before Zeta, I worked at Elastic. And one of our favorite models there to answer pretty much any question was, it depends. Um, and I'd say that applies to schema migrations as well. So every application is, is unique in one way or another. Uh, as, as your applications grow in complexity, so do the schema migrations. And so you may, may find yourself writing pages and pages of documentation, but for good reason. Uh, micromanaging the schema migrations means that petabytes of customer data are safe, your multi-million or multi-billion dollar business continues to run smoothly, uh, and there are no hiccups along the way. And so when, you're, when you hit this stage um, in organizations like this, uh, schema migrations typically are categorized by type and smaller, more frequent changes are preferred. And so there may also be processes in place for things like feature flags or canary deployments for multi-tenant environments. Generally, I'd say whatever approach you take, good documentation is always a welcome addition. Uh, for this example specifically, it's actually from GitLab. Um, I, if, if you've never seen this before and this is a topic of interest to you, I definitely check it out. They have a pretty good lengthy documentation on how they roll these out internally. <clears throat> then there's always the possibility that downtime is acceptable for both your application and your business. And so maybe your audience is only around during business hours, or if you, you have regular planned maintenance every month, in which case you can take more of a big bang approach. Uh, so multi-step processes or intimately integrated ORMs simply aren't necessary to avoid downtime. And so this gives you more time to get creative with your maintenance window page. Um, I looked for a while for some funny ones. Um, there are some interesting ones out there. I thought this Etsy beta one was pretty funny. Um, <clears throat> all right. And so when you start seriously considering more destructive changes to your schema, third-party tooling becomes more of a necessity to keep track of the changes uh, and then version them and then perform the migrations. And so here's a quick lay of the land. Uh, I won't go into too much detail. Uh, but there, there are a number of tools out there for database schema migrations. This list, I'd say, is just generally scratching the surface. It's a mix of solutions that have been around for a while and newcomers. Um, so I won't go too deep in each one, but we'll give you kind of enough details to give you a sense of what's out there today. And I will start by saying that all of these have some version of open source associated with them. Uh, Liquid Base and Flyway have been in the space for some time. If you search for schema migrations, I'd say that these are probably the first two that come up. Uh, Liquidbase has been there, been around since 2006, actually, so almost two decades. Uh, both of these offerings have free open source solution and a pay tier. Uh, Liquidbase is a bit more geared towards enterprise use cases, whereas Flyway, I'd say, is, is, a, is a little more developer oriented. Both of these solutions can use SQL to write migration scripts, though Liquidbase offers other formats like YAML, XML, and JSON, and support a, a pretty wide variety of databases. And so there are numerous features that are gated at the paid tier in interesting ways, I'd say. Flyway, for example, rollbacks and, uh, rollbacks and schema diffs are paid functionality only, whereas Liquidbase will offer things, uh, will gate on schema diffs and targeted rollbacks. And so um, a lot of core functionality required to, to use these uh, for schema migrations are actually uh, behind a paywall. Skitch is interesting. It's 100% open source. Um, because it's positioned itself as like a standalone change management system. Uh, it's unopinionated by your application framework, database engine, or development environment. And unlike Liquidbase or Flyway, there is no need to really number or name your migrations in a certain way. Skits kind of handles that for you. It's a unique solution, and it aims to make it easy to integrate into your existing environment. Atlas and ByteBaits are very much the new kids on the block. Uh, you can see kind of the, the popularity in ByteBase stars there, but I wouldn't necessarily attribute that to uh, usage and adoption stars are kind of, I don't know, one metric. Um, and uh, they, they lean a lot more into development experience and the database's code approach. Uh, 
And both have open source and cloud offerings um, and aim to do much more than schema migrations. They support multiple databases. Um, and Bytebase, for instance, offers a single platform to change, query, secure, and govern all your databases. So it's a little more than just the migration use case. Um, they compare themselves as like Git to GitHub databases, database schema changes, and, and et cetera, to uh, kind of DevOps for databases. Um, and so last but not least, uh, I'll touch a bit on Reshape. Uh, this is an open source uh, project that's relatively new, I'd say, um, and provides a novel way for handling schema migrations. Though unlike these other tools, it doesn't support multiple databases. The tool is only for Postgres, which means it can do some pretty interesting things that other tools can't. Reshape actually inspired the creation of PG Role at Zeta. So rather than going any deeper here, I'm going to pass the mic to Andrew to dive a bit into PG Role and give us a demo. It's all yours, Andrew. Thank you, Alex. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Farris. I'm a software engineer here at Zeta. And I'm going to give you a brief introduction to a tool we've been working on called PG Role. So PG Roll is an open source tool for zero downtime, easily reversible schema migrations for Postgres databases. At Zeta, we've started open sourcing parts of our platform and releasing them as individual standalone tools for Postgres. Uh, PG Roll is the first tool that we've um, open sourced in this way. I'm going to talk first about the design goals for PG Roll and why we built it and how it differs from the existing migration tools that are out there today. Um, and then I'll give a short demo of PG Roll to show some of those ideas in practice. But first, the design goals for PG Roll. So Alex has already mentioned the expand contract pattern. So this is a fairly well understood software design pattern or refactoring pattern. It says that if you have a software interface, let's say, for example, a C Sharp or a Java interface, and you want to change some of the functionality on that interface. The expand contract pattern says that rather than make that change to the interface and then update all of the clients for that interface directly in one change, you should instead make an additive change to the interface, add the new functionality to the interface, and then change all of the clients, or up, create new clients that consume that new functionality. Once all, of the old client, once all of the old clients are updated or removed, you can then remove the functionality from the interface. So interface changes become a two-step process. There's an expansion phase where new functionality is added, followed by a contract phase where the old functionality is removed. This isn't a very new or exciting idea. Uh, it's been used to being used today um, for database migrations. But the issue is that everybody has to work out for themselves each time what the expand phase for a migration looks like. So how do I make an additive change to my database schema in such a way that I can keep the older versions of my application running alongside the new ones? So we asked ourselves, what would a migration tool look like that was really built around this expand contract pattern? That if you like, took this pattern and made it a simple primitive operation inside the migration tool. And PG Roll is really our answer to that question. So in database terms, the expand contract pattern means that when you start or when you run a PG Roll migration, it's divided into two phases. There's a start or expand phase during which PG Roll will create a new virtual schema that contains the change you want to make for your migration. And we keep that live in your database alongside the old version of your database schema. What this enables then is application rollouts without downtime. When you roll out an application, typically there's going to be a small window where both old and new versions of your application are alive in production at the same time. This is usually where the difficulties start with database migrations because the old version of your database schema has been mutated in such a way that it's now incompatible with the old versions of your application. But by using the expand contract pattern, we can ensure that the old version of your database schema is live alongside the new for this rollout period. So that while your old and new versions of the app are up and running, the database, each version of those applications sees the version of the database schema that it expects to see. 
One of the other issues we wanted to solve with PG Roll was to have no nasty surprises around locking behavior. So many people listening to this probably have experience with production migrations, long running migrations that have in inadvertently taken out a long lived exclusive lock on a database resource, like a table, for example, which has the effect of locking out writers from that table for the duration of the migration. This is a very common source of problems with database migrations. And we wanted to build that kind of Postgres operator specific knowledge directly into the tool so that whenever a database object is modified by a migration, PG Roll knows how to sequence the operations to take exclusive locks for the shortest possible time to avoid these kind of issues. Another consequence of using the expand contract pattern for database migrations is that rollbacks become much easier. When you want to roll back a Postgres migration, um, because the old version of your database schema is still around and live, there's no database mutation, there's no state mutation required to put your database back in a state suitable for the old versions of your applications. The old version of the database schema never went away, and thus a rollback just means removing the new version of the database schema. If we're going to have two versions of your database schema live at the same time, we also have to address the problem of data backfilling between the old and the new schema versions. While your old versions of your app are running alongside the new, people think consumers, customers will be writing data to the database through the old versions of the application. And that needs to be visible in the new versions as well. So this requires some data copying between the old and the new schema versions. In some cases, this can be a straight copy. In other cases, where there are additional constraints on the new version schema, this may require some translation modification of the data. And we wanted all of this to be able to be handled inside the migration tool without having to write application specific logic to do this. We decided from the outset that PG Roll would only support Postgres. Some of the other tools that Alex has mentioned, like Flyway and Liquibase, support multiple different database engines. And this is great. It means that you can leverage your knowledge of those tools, tools to write migrations across different database engines. But what you lose with this approach is the ability for the migration tool to take advantage of specific features in a database engine that might make migrations easier or more efficient. By restricting ourselves to Postgres only, PG Roll can go deep into Postgres and take advantage of Postgres specific features to enable zero downtime migrations. Lastly, we wanted to build post, we wanted to build PG Roll in the open as an open source project. We had a good reaction to the initial v0.1 release of PG Roll, and that's continued in terms of engagement on the issue tracker and external contributions to the to the project in terms of pull requests. And that's something we'd really really like to continue. So I think uh, now we can jump into a demo of PG Roll to show some of these ideas um, how they work in practice. So as we mentioned, PG Roll is a tool that aims to make zero downtime migrations in Postgres easy. To help demo PG Roll, we put together a very simple demo application. It's a straightforward two-tier web app with a single page app on the front end, uh, talking to an API server, and that's connected to a Postgres data store. We're going to roll out two versions of this application, V1 and V2, and we'll see how PG Roll makes this application rollout easy, even though V2 of the application makes incompatible changes to the Postgres database schema. The application itself is very straightforward. It's just a to-do list that we can add items to one by one, as many as we like. And on the back end, on the database level, it's also as simple as you might expect. So there's one items table containing all the items in the to-do list. Each item has a name, whether or not it's done, and the assignee. The schema is also very simple with uh, just those four fields and a primary key on the ID field. What we'd like to do now is roll out a VB2 version of our application. 
B2 adds a constraint that the only valid assignees for a to-do list item are either Alice or Bob. No other assignees are valid. In database terms, that means what we want to do is add a constraint to the assignee field. Although this is a very simple change to make to a database schema, it's already quite a difficult change to roll out in a zero downtime way. As we've seen, we already have V1 instances of our application live in production today. And in a more realistic setting, you would have multiple instances, multiple replicas of this application, possibly geo-distributed across different regions. And when we roll out V2 of our application, there's going to be a period of time where we have both versions of the application in production. And we'd like our, uh, our database migration not to break existing V1 applications. If we were to apply the migration directly in a naive way to the database and add the constraint directly to the assignee field, we would break V1 instances in production. The V1 versions of the app don't know anything about this new constraint on the assignee field, and they would allow users to write arbitrary assignees. And these inserts would then fail on the database layer and users would see errors in the V1 instances of the application. PG Roll is going to help us do this migration by creating a virtual schema to support V1 during the rollout of V2. We can have a look at the migration that we're, go that we're going to write um, to do this migration. So the first thing we see is that PG Roll's migration format is JSON, as opposed to raw SQL as it might be in some other tools that you've used in the past. By working at this slightly higher level of abstraction, we allow PG Roll to have fine control over the precise sequence of operations that it takes to implement the migration. In particular, this allows PG Roll to avoid taking long-lived locks on the database resources that it's working with to ensure that we don't end up in the situation we mentioned before, where we have uh, database locking issues causing downtimes during migrations. This is a very common source of downtime during database migrations. The migration format itself is fairly straightforward. So the migration is applied to the assign to the items table on the assignees column. We're adding a check constraint with this name and the constraint here is, is defined here defining these two values as the only fields valid for the, for the assignee field. We also have these two up and down fields in the migration, and we'll explain in a moment what those fields are doing. For the moment, we can start the migration, and simultaneously, we'll start the rollout of the v2 versions of our application. So the V2 versions of our application look very similar to V1, but the UI enforces this extra constraint that there are only two possible assignees. Notice that the assignee that we wrote in via the V1 version of the app has been transparently modified in V2's view of the data to something that meets the new constraint. So already we can see that V1 and V2 have slightly different views of the same underlying data in the database. We can add new items to the to-do list in V2. And because they're connected to the same data store, the data that we write into the V2 applications during the rollout period is reflected in the old V1 instances as well. But crucially, we can also add instances via the old V1 versions of the application. Because this is a V1 instance, we can assign whatever assignee we want. And ordinarily, had we added the constraint directly, we would break the V1 instance at this point. But the V1 instance is still able to work and insert arbitrary assignees. And again, PG Roll is transparently rewriting the data to meet the constraint so that V2 and V1 have different views of the same database, the da same data in the database. So PG Roll has made a virtual schema to support V1 during the rollout of V2, allowing it to run despite the incompatible change that was made to the underlying physical database schema. This allows V1 and V2 to run side by side during a rollout period, even though V1 was never designed to work with the new database schema. <laughs> 
we can have a look a little more closely at what effect starting that migration actually had on the database schema. So the first thing we can see is that a new column was added to the, to the database table, this PG role new assignee field. And the constraint was actually added to this new column, not the existing assignee field that was already there. So the database has been expanded during the expansion phase of the migration to include this new column. We also defined these two new triggers on the table and we'll talk in a moment what they're for. So if we have a look at the data in the table, we can see that both the assignee field and the new assignee field are populated with data. So during the expansion phase, when the migration was started, data was backfilled from the old assignee field into the new one. And that's what this up SQL in the migration definition was for. So any values in the old assignee fields that didn't meet the constraint were rewritten to something that did, and anything that did meet the constraint was simply copied over directly. The two triggers on the table ensure that as data is written into the old v1 versions of the applications, that they get copied over into the new field, and vice versa. Any data that's written into the v2 versions of the application gets copied across into the old version of the data. So that's how the v1 and v2 instances have slightly different views of the same data in the database. During the expansion phase or the start phase, PG Roll also created two new database schema. There's a v1 and a v2. Each one of these database schema contains a view on the underlying items table. So the first view for the v1 version uh, is just a straightforward one-to-one -one mapping of the columns in the underlying table. So we, the view exposes the same four, same four fields as the are on the underlying table and maps them in a simple way, one-to-one. -one. The second schema, the v2 schema, is almost the same, but here the assignee field is mapped to the new assignee field on the underlying table. And this is, how, this is how V1 and V2 are able to have different views of the data in the database. So the V1 application instances are configured to connect to the database using this V1 version of the schema, and the V2 instances connect to the database through this V2 version of the schema. Eventually, your rollout of the V2 instances of the applications will complete, and you'll have no more V1 instances left in production. At that point, you'll be able to complete the migration. The complete phase corresponds to the contract phase in the expand contract pattern, and what it does is removes the new version schema, or removes the old version schema, sorry, leaving just the new version, and it also cleans up the underlying table. So the two triggers have gone, the extra column has gone, we have just the assignee field as we did before, and the constraint is defined directly on that field. At this point, v1 versions of the applications will no longer work because the version of the schema that they depend on is no longer present in the database, and we will have finished our application rollout to v2. So hopefully this simple example shows how PG Roll makes zero downtime migrations easier by using virtual schema at the database level to mask incompatible changes to a physical schema, allowing different versions of an application to coexist during a rollout. As we mentioned earlier, PG Roll is an open source tool. Um, it's available on GitHub and uh, we would very much welcome any contributions in terms of issues and pull requests. Um, so if you're interested in this kind of expand contract style of migration is interesting, then we'd love to have your input. So we're working to integrate PG Roll into the Zeta platform itself. Um, this here shows how we might integrate some of the schema history UI into, into Zeta. So this is very much something that we're looking to build in to the platform directly. Um, at this point, I think I'll hand back over to Alex for any uh, any final words. Yeah, we have um, 
We have a few uh, questions that I thought might be useful to uh, go through. Yeah, let me just bring this up. So uh, the first one, Andrew, um, and we can answer these together, but, uh, and I think you just kind of hinted towards this, but basically will will um, this be implemented into, into Zeta or something that we have to run on our own? And so uh, just from the previous slide, uh, there was a screenshot of kind of uh, work in progress right now. So we're actively working on integrating PG role and all the supported uh, migration types uh, and our operations uh, into, into Zeta itself. And so we should be seeing that soon uh, as a public beta. And um, there was a question, Andrew, uh, will PG role work with open source PostgreSQL? Uh, if so, which versions? Uh, you're muted. I think you're talking. Uh, yeah, so Postgres PG roll what works with PG roll PG roll works with Postgres versions 14 or later. Um, so that's really the only requirement. So it should work with um, self-hosted and cloud options like RDS and Aurora as well. Awesome, and I'm just I'll repeat these were answered in chat, but uh, I figured I'd repeat as well for folks watching the recording. Um, in the migration schema, is there a way to specify what value is used uh, in the PG role new assignee column with those triggers, or would we just use a column default? Um, so when you're writing the up SQL in the PG role migrations, you can essentially specify any SQL that you like. So you have complete control over exactly what data is backfilled. In the example that we saw, it was a simple hard coded value. But um, essentially, yes, you can write whatever SQL you need to write for your application logic in those migration files. All right, awesome. And then um, there was a question around Django support. Uh, I, uh, how can I find more documentation generally on, on PG role? And um, is there a developer that uh, we can speak with for any questions? Yeah, so all of the documentation for PG role is currently on the uh, GitHub repo itself. Um, so I'm sure we can put a link to that in the chat. So we have there the main readme as well as a tutorial, uh, also in the repo documentation. Um, we also recently published a blog post on the Zeta blog going into slightly more depth, which has a, a worked example of how to use PG role, set up a database to use it and runs through two or three migrations. So yes, it's the repo and the Zeta blog currently that uh, is the best source of documentation. If you have questions about it, of course, uh, please open issues in the repo and we'll try to be responsive and answer them there. Yep, and there's also instructions for contributions too if you're interested in, in uh, contributing to the project itself. Uh, and then one last question, uh, what operations does PG Role support today? Um, so again, the documentation contains a full list. Um, but we're able to do um, create table operations, pretty much all alter column operations, adding constraints, uh, unique constraints, defaults. Um, but the documentation is probably the best source of the available operations. We should also add that there's also a kind of raw SQL escape hatch. So if there's something that you want to do that PG Role doesn't currently do, uh, we allow that by supporting raw SQL operations. The caveat there is that you don't get that multi-version uh, automatically. So uh, you have to ensure yourself that you're expanding your database in, in a way that's sort of, um, sort of um, backwards compatible. Um, but that escape hatch does exist, yes. Awesome, thanks, Andrew. Uh, and I think, I think that's it for the questions. Um, generally, everybody, uh, thank you for your time. We'll, we'll send out this recording. Uh, and if you're if you're interested in discussing more, feel free to find us on Discord. Um, and if you'd like to contribute, just check out our repo uh, and drop an issue or PR in there. Um, thank you again for your time. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the presentation and the demo. And I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. Thanks a lot. See you all out there. Thank you.